Hello everyone, it's History Behind the Warrior, and welcome back to another installment in my Mortal Kombat History of series. With the hype train now finally underway, with this week's incredible San Diego Comic Con reveal, I figured that seeing as we tackled his now older brother last week, Today, it would only be right to go over this iconic character in the Mortal Kombat franchise, his everlasting impact on the series, and gaming media as a whole. Plus, it is this character that really did start it all for the channel, so I do have a bit of a soft spot when it does come to Scorpion here. But I've done this video before, haven't I? Well, yeah, but since then, a lot has changed about myself, how I approach these videos, and really, the series as a whole. Because from the last time I made this episode, the Mortal Kombat franchise has opened up in a really big way, beyond parameters ever previously conceived that delve into a multiverse filled with live action depictions, animated movies, spin-offs, and guest characters. And of course, with Liu Kang ascending to godhood, it's pretty jarring to know where everything starts and how to follow the canon. Thus, this video is designed to be a bit of a refresher course for you older fans, as well as a great introduction point for some of you newer ones that are looking to get into the series. So today, with a new dawn and new era on the horizon, I think that this would be a great opportunity to revisit those older videos, educate you newer fans, as well as covering some interesting bits for you older ones that may have glossed over. Now, mind you, just before we do begin, a quick disclaimer that whilst making this video at San Diego Comic Con, they did reveal the official identity of Scorpion as Kwai Liang, his rival, the second Sub-Zero. But to streamline this video, I will be solely focusing on Hanzo Hisashi's tale, as it would naturally make more sense to understand the title of this character and how it's earned such an infamous legacy in the series. Now to kick things off, let's actually talk about how Scorpion came to be, because there is in fact an interesting story behind this character's creation. Now this takes us all the way back to 1992, just past the late 80s boom and prime of the arcade era. Here, Ed Boon and John Tobias were in the process of creating characters for a very small game called Mortal Kombat. The original design for the character was simply brand as Ninja, where it would be a tale of two brothers, with one being hunted down whilst the other had overthrown their clan and was using it to track him down. Whilst most certainly a very compelling tale, these ideas would be left on the cutting room floor, later being utilized for Mortal Kombat 3 with the Cyber Initiative. But the conception of this idea of there being two ninjas would actually lead to the original design being split in two, with the two ninjas only being distinguishable from their color-coded designs. Thus, it led to the birth and creation of Sub-Zero and, of course, Scorpion, with Ed Boon himself voicing the iconic spear line that did help launch this franchise into the stratosphere. Get over here! So with the development of this character out of the way, this now takes us to what I would consider to be the Golden Age of Mortal Kombat. But what exactly is the Golden Age? Well, in my mind, the Golden Age would be the Midway Saga of games. Essentially, the main framework and installments that many future games, comics, and movies would base their premise off. It more or less became the standard for how the characters are treated and developed. Now, this takes us to the very first timeline of the series. But the beginning of Scorpion's tale actually begins prior to the events of the first game, learning that beneath the mask is a man by the name of Hanzo Hisashi, a highly skilled assassin of the Shirai Ryu, a Japanese clan of ninjas, and one of two extremely successful assassin organizations in Eastern Asia. Hanzo was actually seen as the most successful amongst his clansmen, even being dubbed 
loved by their enemies, the Lin Kuei, as Scorpion for his legendary skill with a kunai. But Hanzo wasn't quite so one-dimensional, despite what the legends would tell. He was a family man, a husband, and a father, being married to Harumi and having a son by the name of Satoshi. The details surrounding their home life is largely left Explore, due to how early on his origin this takes place. But it is believed that they did have a relatively happy and joyful life. But tragically, this would all later crumble with what would come next. Now, canonically, this takes us up to the events of the spin off game Mortal Kombat Mythology Sub Zero. Here in secrecy, the Shirai Ryu would be approached by the necromancer Quan Chi, a demon of the Neverrealm seeking to acquire an ancient scroll, the Scroll of Elements. Not one to turn down a contract, Hanzo would travel out to the sacred Shaolin Temple to retrieve it. But of course, nothing is quite so simple, as the ninja had been played by the necromancer. In secret, Quan Chi had also reached out to the Lin Kuei to somewhat guarantee its retrieval, pitting a clash between himself and the clan's best assassin, the cryomancer Sub-Zero. Blood would bathe the foundation of the temple, and in the end, it was the Han that was victorious having slain Hanzo. But this wouldn't technically be the end of his suffering, as his very death would lead to the fall of the Shirai Ryu, having been massacred by Quan Chi in secret, although his family would survive. So Hanzo would be consumed by the flames of the Neverrealm, left to rot in the endless abyss. But in his sorrow, what Quan Chi saw here was potential. Thus, the demon laid before him a choice. To rot in hellfire and brimstone, or to instead rise from its ashes anew and reclaim his lost honor. To vanquish those responsible for his clan's death. And with little to no hesitation, Hanzo would accept Quan Chi's offer. Consumed by eternal flame, Hanzo would now be reborn as Scorpion. As the Hell Spectre, Scorpion would make his first appearance during the later half of mythology seeking vengeance against his clan's supposed killer. But it seems that once more, the Cryomancer is able to slip through his clutches. But their rivalry was far from over, as this now takes us on to the events of the very first game, and really where the Golden Age begins. Mortal Kombat. Now it is worth noting that due to the time period of when this game was released, as it was during the arcade era, story details around this time are pretty damn scarce. So we don't entirely know who fights who, or the true canonical events that proceed within the tournament itself. But from what we can gather is that during the end of the tournament, Upon Shang's defeat at the hands of Liu Kang, Scorpion would once again confront Sub-Zero, this time finally gaining the upper hand and slaying the Cryomancer, fulfilling his quest as the island crumbled around him. But the death of Bi Han would not be the end of this feud. Bleeding over into the events of Mortal Kombat 2, upon returning to the Neverrealm, he would catch word that somehow Sub-Zero still continued to walk amongst the land of the living. So during the second tournament, he would relentlessly hunt down this Sub-Zero, finally ready to claim his lost victory. But during this tournament, Hanzo would come to realize that this wasn't the same Sub-Zero, as he had seen him spare someone's life. It was Bi Han's younger brother, Kui Liang, seeking vengeance for his predecessor's demise. But seeing absolutely no quarrel with him, Scorpion would instead spare his life seeing much of his own anger in the young man. So from this point onwards, he would instead work as an unforeseen protector from the shadows. But all hell would break loose during the events of Mortal Kombat 3. Following Emperor Shao's defeat at the climax of 2, the bitter tyrant would still continue his invasion of Earthrealm. And as worlds began to merge, Scorpion would be able to act of his own volition, no longer strictly tied under the hand of Quan 
Chi. And surprisingly so, at first, he would ally with the Emperor. However, as the war unraveled, this partnership would quickly dissolve as Sub-Zero's involvement caused him to switch sides. So the Emperor would be left to fall to the hands of Liu Kang once more. And what many of you might not know is that initially, Scorpion wasn't playable on Mortal Kombat 3's release, only actually becoming playable from Ultimate onwards. So with Shao's invasion finally over, Scorpion would return back to the Neverrealm, and for a time, was at peace. But this now takes us to Mortal Kombat 4. Here, the fallen elder god Shinnok would be unleashed by the Brotherhood of Shadow. But this particular plotline does not actually intertwine with Scorpion as during this game, he would learn from Quan Chi that his beloved family had been slain by the very man he had sworn to protect. Eclipsed by his own anger, Hanzo would begin to hunt down Sub-Zero, mercilessly beating him into an inch of his life. But it's here where he learns the truth, that Sub-Zero wasn't responsible for their demise. But it was Quan Chi. His anger had been misplaced, misguided, and weaponized by the sorcerer. The two had been played from the very beginning. But before the necromancer could rid himself of this spectre, Scorpion would drag him to the depths of the Neverrealm, torturing him for his lies and sins. Which now takes us on to the events of Deadly Alliance. And it's during this game where Quan is narrowly able to slip through his grasp, portal hopping away in the hopes of creating as much distance as possible. And he would find success by befriending two Oni by the name of Dramin and Moloch just strong enough to hold off the vengeful spectre, thus allowing Quan Chi to ally with Shang Tsung. But the formation of the Deadly Alliance would not stop him, as he tore his way across the realm in order to hunt him down. This time, however, he was far too overzealous in his actions being caught off guard by the Oni once more, and then tossed into a destructive Sornado, being the presumed end of Hunzo Hisashi. But the fates had a very different destiny ahead of him. Coming into Mortal Kombat Deception, an unexpected event would transpire, with Scorpion actually being plucked from the Sornado by the very Elder Gods themselves. But why? Well, during this time period, where both Liu Kang and Shao Kahn were murdered, yet another threat loomed in the shadows. Not the Deadly Alliance themselves, but the returning Dragon King, Onaga. Seeing the threat he posed, Scorpion would be chosen by them to become the champion, to slay the beast and free the realms of his conquest. But this wouldn't be a service that he'd do freely. Scorpion bargained that if he did complete this task, then the Shirai Ryu would be returned back to the land of the living. Whilst a very ambitious dream, this was a deal that the Elder Gods agreed to. And with it so, Scorpion would become their champion, traveling across the realms to hunt Onaga. But instead, he would find his emissary, Sujinko, an elderly gentleman, tasked to acquire the Kami Dogu. Seeing the danger he posed, he would try his best to stop him, but the talent and the skill of the old man completely caught him off guard, so his efforts were in vain. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that there wasn't a form of success here, as Onaga himself would actually go on to be defeated by Shijinko. So in a way, Hanzo did fulfill his end of the bargain, and so did the Elder God but in their own twisted way. As we reach the Twilight Eclipse end of the Golden Age, with its final installment being Armageddon, we learn that post-deception, the Shirai Ryu suffered a gruesome fate. Yes, they did return back to the land of the living, but they were brought back as fully-fledged specters much like Scorpion himself. Understandably hurt and betrayed, Scorpion would curse the gods, waging a one-man crusade for their downfall. But once he learned the prophecy of Armageddon, 
and how it was in fact pivotal on the survival of two Edenian demigod brothers, Taven and Dagon. He would begin to actively hunt them down, believing that by killing them, he could actually topple the gods. And up to a certain extent, he would get his wish once the Battle of Armageddon began, as both sides would crumble and the brothers were presumably killed. With the realms merging and the heavens toppling, Scorpion got what he wanted. But this isn't a victory he would live to see, as he was one of many casualties during the War of Armageddon, ironically perishing to the blade of Sub-Zero. So this actually marks the end of the Golden Age and the original continuity of Mortal Kombat, then propelling us into the next big cycle and saga, the Reboot Trilogy. Now in this reboot, we more or less pick off where Armageddon finished off, with its climax being Raiden sending a message to his past self. This in turn creates a bit of a butterfly effect of sorts, that slightly changes and alters the origins in the original canon. In short, the events that transpire here basically serve as both a reboot and a sequel to the franchise, as the events that follow all take place from the very first tournament. And for the most part, things do generally play out the same here, as he still does die during the events of mythologies, coming back as a spectre for Quan Chi. The only real big difference and change is when his family does die, as they would fall alongside the rest of the Shira Ryu instead of perishing during Shinnok's invasion. Scorpion would make his very first appearance during the first tournament with his objective being extremely clear, to avenge his clan's honour and to kill Sub-Zero. Thus, he would participate in the tournament to gain that right, going on to defeat the likes of Kong Lao and even Nightwolf. But as things die down, he would later be approached by Raiden. Having known of his fate, he does attempt to consult with Scorpion, saying that if he was to spare the Cryomancer's life, then he in turn would try to convince the Elder God about restoring his clan. Although naturally hesitant, he does accept the offer, but his confidence would very quickly crumble, as once he defeats the likes of Cyrax and Sector, he would then be confronted by B. Han. Seeking to claim justice, he would quite literally drag him down to the Neverrealm, guaranteeing that this was their final fight. But in victory, he would spare him, remembering his deal with Raiden. But all it took was one simple push from Quan to change that, showing him the devastation of his clan and his family finally sent Hunzo over the edge. And so, Sub-Zero is killed, and the fate of the Shira Ryu would be sealed. From this point onwards, he does continue to participate in the tournament, but only plays a rather minor and antagonistic role, surfacing during Liu Kang's chapter, where he and his allies are defeated by the Shaolin, and then later appearing during the Mortal Kombat 2 section, where he is forcibly summoned by his master and confronted by a very new and much younger Sub-Zero, Kwai Liang. But unlike the original canon, he shows absolutely no remorse against the younger brother, but he is defeated by this new Sub-Zero. But before he can be killed, in an unforeseen twist of fate, Hunzo would be saved by the Lin Kuei, now cyberized and seeking to capture all remaining human members. Scorpion then makes his final appearance in this game during its final chapter, where the Earthrealm heroes have fallen and a very desperate Raiden seeks out the Council of Quan Chi, to only then be halted by the Hell Spectre, showing his disdain to the god and telling him to leave. But instead, he would be scolded by Raiden for his blind justice. And it leads to a fight between the two, with Scorpion simply being no match for him. And so, this then brings us onto Mortal Kombat X. And a lot goes down during this time period, as there's roughly about a 20 year jump between 9 to X. As Shao Kahn is defeated, Shinnok would begin his invasion and ultimately fail, and Scorpion is restored back to his human 
form. So, upon regaining his humanity, he would recreate Bashirai Ryu, picking up where he had left off. Now, in between this time skip, Hanzo would also take on a student by the name of Takeda Takahashi, the son of Kenshi, teaching him the ways of the Shirai Ryu as thanks to his father for helping him regain his humanity so many years ago. And it's also during this time where peace would be made between himself and Kwa Liang, as despite the shaky grounds of their relationship, it was the Grand Master that revealed to him the true fate of his family, and how it was Quan Chi responsible for their fates. Knowing that blood demands blood, Hanzo would slowly bind his time, waiting for Quan Chi to exit the Neverrealm to then strike. And that he did, once Quan was captured by the special forces. Their base would be stormed by his Shirai Ryu, to which he would then beat the Necromancer within an inch of his life. Although he would temporarily be stopped by Devora, all it took was one well-placed spear and one swing of his blade to avenge the fallen. But blinded by his own justice once more, Hanzo had also damned the heroes of all, leaving them in their revenant forms. And he also hadn't noticed that he had given Quan Chi enough free time to free Shinnok from his amulet. Being subdued by the fallen Elder God as he travelled to the heart of the Jinsei. Fortunately, his efforts would be bested by Johnny Cage's daughter, Cassie. So now, this takes us to the most recent installment with Mortal Kombat 11. And seeing as we're juggling between two versions of the same character, it's definitely gonna get a tad bit confusing. So just to make it clear which version of each character I'll be referring to, I will be addressing past Hanzo as Scorpion and present Hanzo simply as Hanzo. Trust me, it's gonna get a bit confusing. Now onto the story of Eleven. Whilst not specified, we know that quite a bit of time has passed from X to Eleven, with Hanzo having fully revived his clan and even restored their home with their fire gardens. But of course, the peace never lasts. Due to Raiden's tampering of the timeline, he has in fact inadvertently provoked the fury of an ancient titan goddess, Kronika seeking vengeance for his son Shinnok, and wishing to bring in a new age, Kronika would cause a time quake, merging the past timeline of MK2 with that of the present. It in turn creates this living, breathing paradox, where both the past and the present can coexist. We first see the spectre during Liu Kang and Kung Lao's chapter, where not long after the timelines have merged, the two would set out to the Wuxi Academy, only to find it in ruin, with the Shaolin dead in Kronika's conquest. It's here where they would come into conflict with Scorpio, being stopped by the Shaolin monks. We then next cut to Hanzo Hisashi, where it looks like the time merger has revived the Cyber Lin Kuei, who immediately pick up where they left off. Seeing the threats they pose, he would join forces with Kwai Liang in order to destroy the facility. And once inside, they would battle the likes of Cyrax, a fully cyberized Frost, the returning noob Cybot, and even Sector. Despite the numbers game, their Age of Steel would be destroyed. Now, at this point, Hanzo would retreat back to his fire garden, later being joined by his new and somewhat former ally on their attack against Kronika. So to begin their assault, he would need to gain Kairon's assistance, only to come across the deadly Kaitin Devora. And things only exacerbate once he is confronted by his past self. The two mirrors of Hanzo's life clash, with his human counterpart gaining the upper hand. But instead of ending him, he would plead to his younger self, knowing full well that there is indeed some good in him. But caught off guard, Hanzo would be attacked and poisoned by Devora. Unable to escape his fate, he would die in the arms of his past self, wanting to leave behind a foundation and legacy that Scorpion could embrace. However, when he finds the Earthrealm Defenders, they still believe him to be aligned with Kronika, 
forced to battle the likes of Kuai Liang and even Raiden. And it's at this point where his words do fall on deaf ears as he's nearly killed by Raiden, until he is saved by Liu Kang, having him realize that the Time Goddess was pitting them against each other. What follows here is a massive assault on Kronika's key, with Hanzo himself waging war against the Neverrealm. Now really, he does play a super minor role here, but it is one that does help turn the tide as Liu Kang is able to defeat Kronika and acquires her Hourglass of Time. Canonically, following this point is where Aftermath does take place. It is a tad bit confusing, as the Aftermath timeline itself takes place in a entirely different splintered timeline, one that runs completely parallel to the events of Mortal Kombat 11. So Scorpion's appearance here is extremely bare, not playing much of a role in the story DLC. So this would be the last time we see Hanzo Hasashi, but now in the present, with the timeline having been reset, a new dawn awaits Scorpion, one unlike anything we've ever seen before. The future for this character looks to be both very interesting and very different, as he's now the brother to be Han, the new Grand Master of the Link. Way. But having killed their father and strayed away from his legacy, it does look to only be a matter of time before the two inevitably clash. So yeah guys, that's been it for the history of Scorpion, and I do hope you have enjoyed it. This has been a long time coming, so I sincerely hope this has cleared up the timeline a little bit, as there's just so much Mortal Kombat content out there that it's super difficult to know where to begin. This series in particular is very near and dear to my heart. So I hope that this not only has given you a bit of a nostalgic trip down memory lane, but also served as a way to jog your memory, whilst simultaneously introducing some of you newer fans to the universe. So with that said, and everything covered here guys, if you like what we do here and wish to see more, please don't forget to subscribe as well as tick that bell, as I will be dropping a new episode every week up until Mortal Kombat 1's release. So you definitely want to keep an eye out for those. But for now everyone, stay strong, stay well, and keep on fighting. Take care everyone, I'll catch you all soon.